Hi, I'm Joel uh, Salinas, and uh, it's very nice to meet you all. Uh, I am a neurologist. Uh, I see patients at Massachusetts General Hospital. I'm assistant professor of neurology at Harvard Medical School. And uh, full disclosure, I, I know that some people see me and uh, think that I'm not old enough to vote. <laughs> Let alone practice neurology. Uh, proud to say I do both. <laughs> uh, and uh, the one of the one of the things that I have the pleasure of, of doing is uh, seeing lots of patients. I specialize in behavioral neurology and neuropsychiatry, so I kind of uh, live a lot in kind of this intersection between kind of the, the brain and the kind of inner landscape of the of the mind. Uh, uh, I think one other kind of disclosure about my presentation is that we'll be talking about issues of mental health. There'll be some imagery about people in psychological distress. Um, and there will be a couple of images about, uh, about violence, so if, if uh, you find that disturbing, please be, please be warned. Um, and uh, I also kind of share some of my own personal story and some of the themes I talk about today in, in, a, in a book that I've uh, written. Um, and I think the reason why uh, you know, I got really into neurology and understanding the brain really ties back to uh, my, own, my own childhood. Uh, this is me. <laughs> Uh, and uh, so my, my parents are originally from uh, Nicaragua, and they fled Nicaragua during the Re Revolutionary War. Uh, and so I'm a first generation uh, immigrant in the, in the US. Uh, and I uh, distinctly remember growing up always feeling very, very kind of out of place every space that I was at. There was something kind of different or odd about me. And it was only until my first year of uh, medical school that I actually learned that there was a term for it. And it's called synesthesia. Uh, some of you may be familiar with the term synesthesia. Actually, if you know what the term synesthesia means, could you raise your hands. Great. Oh, so easy. Easy crowd. Uh, so uh, so as, you, as many of you know, the synesthesia is kind of like a blending of the senses that relates to the brain. And it can have very different pre uh, presentations in different people. Uh, and it can include whenever you hear sounds or music, uh, there's a kind of uh, visual information also kind of present in your brain. And so as a, as kind of a quick display of what that might look like, uh, here is a video from Andy Thomas. I think it's kind of a decent representation of that. Oh, there's no sound, but uh, you would be hearing a, a bird call. Like, there you go. So you have this very, very lush kind of sensory world that you live in. It can also take other manifestations. So uh, for myself, I also have what's called graphene color synesthesia. When I see letters, they have colors associated with them. So uh, letter C is black, letter A is red, letter T is orange, uh, and that's just the way it is. And when I see patterns like this, if I focus on the C and the T, the middle uh, kind of grapheme becomes red like the letter A. If I focus on the T and the E, it turns orange like the letter H. So it's very much driven in the brain. Uh, another aspect of synesthesia for myself, if uh, you see someone being touched on their right cheek, for all of us, uh, your brain is creating this kind of virtual reality simulation of what it's like to be touched. Uh, and it happens below the level of consciousness, but if you have what's called mirror touch synesthesia, you actually have that physical sensation on your own body as if it were happening to you. Uh, and there's a, been a lot of research in this area looking at just the differences in the structure in the brain of people who have synesthesia. These brains are more connected. Uh, these areas of different uh, senses uh, uh, tend to function together. And in mirror touch, you have similar things where you have differences in the way that your brain looks and the way that your brain works. And even dives even deeper into the genetics where you have uh, people who have synesthesia are genetically different than, than others. And for myself, one of the things that um, uh, that I kind of struggled with is that there was a lot of opportunities for feeling lonely, for feeling alienated, um, and for experiencing pain. But at the same time, synesthesia and my own kind of brain differences uh, really opened up a whole new world for me to these really beautiful experiences that other people might not have and to meet people that I wouldn't have otherwise met. And so there was this kind of uh, tension for me going through the medical world. And I think if you take anything from, from my talk today, I think uh, it would be that the evolution of mental health and the way we think about the brain really presents an opportunity for all of us to triage between curiosity, compassion, and community.
When I say triage, um, that comes from my medical background, and that's some, one of the, probably one of the most important things that I learned in the medical world. So triage in medicine really is about uh, understanding kind of how to prioritize your resources and your time so you can uh, be as helpful as possible uh, for the people that you need to help. And you can apply this concept outside of the medical world. And so for me, looking at kind of mental health and brain health, uh, how, to, how to triage that, you know, I had a lot of resources available to me from uh, a long time. So going all the way back to my childhood, all the things that I saw in the media, like television and stories, uh, were informing about mental health. But it's not always uh, the type of imagery that, um, you, that doesn't age very well. Um, so you, you see cartoons, uh, depictions of mental health are, are usually very outrageous. Uh, movies depicting people with mental uh, health issues as being violent, or mental health treatment being uh, uh, very uh, aggressive, or uh, being kind of the, the kind of the end point of a, of, a, of a joke. You also see it now in the people around us and in social media. You have people who may make a tweet that is very well intentioned, but may actually cause a big backlash because they were not aware of what they were actually communicating. Uh, you also have people who share stories about uh, misrepresentations of what their challenges are or having it downplayed or people kind of uh, making the assumption that they could just stop having their brain or their experiences. And then in the medical world for myself, you also have a very different way of thinking about mental health or a different depiction, uh, which tends to focus a lot more on distress and pain and on suffering. And so uh, going through medical school, for example, you're bombarded with tons of, of, of numbers, lots of statistics from things like the CDC, uh, that it's mental health issues are very common, that it tends to affect people in minority groups in particular, they all have lots of issues with health access, uh, that it tends to affect uh, women in greater numbers. Uh, and so you get number upon number upon number, but there's, uh, there's just, there's, there was something missing there for me. I felt that the story was really incomplete, that there wasn't a human element to it, and it wasn't really giving the full, the full story. And so whenever I want to understand the full story, I try to kind of take a, a, a zoom out to take a look at the history. And so this is kind of like the, the history of kind of mental health and brain health in a nutshell. And I think the highlights here are that um, a lot has really happened just within the last 100 years or so. Um, so just a sliver of human history has really begun to look at brain health and mental health. Uh, it was only until uh, the 1700s that we began to have a concept of, of what we call nervous diseases. Um, and it was in 1952 where we first developed what's called the DSM, the, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, which is kind of this compendium of, of uh, names for diagnoses of, of disorders, so to speak, and they're all kind of made based off of checklists. Um, there's been many iterations since, but I think one of the, the things that really ties all these together is that there has to be some kind of a social or occupational impairment uh, to be considered a, a disorder, in, in addition to these different checkboxes. But I think uh, there's been many changes since then, uh, since the first issue, for example, in the 1970s, homosexuality was declassified as a disorder. And so to me, this shows that the, uh, the actual practice of medicine in this space is actually a byproduct of uh, our culture as well, and our language, the way that we, that we talk about things, and it's constantly evolving. And it was only until we began to have um, imaging technology, for example, CT scans, MRIs, functional uh, MRIs, tactrography now, that we actually have a better sense of the neurobiology behind what's going on, um, kind of really looking under the hood. And now there's the DSM-5, which kind of incorporates a, a, a lot of this, but it's not a perfect text by any stretch of the imagination. Um, but I think it helps to uh, understand kind of where this is all coming from when we think about the brain. So just for, for, for all of us, uh, from the moment that we, we are born, we all have brains, and our brain is made of many, many brain cells, 100 billion brain cells with 100 trillion connections. And that the way these uh, kind of cells communicate with each other is through electrical activity in a sense. And one thing that we know is that when brain cells tend to fire together or are connected, the more they do, the stronger those connections become, and the less they fire together, the weaker those connections become. So they kind of prune themselves. Uh, you can see some of this beautiful activity. This is a zebrafish. This is live kind of imagery of the, the, the brain cells of the zebrafish activating. And you see these cells kind of activate in choruses. They work in circuits. Uh, just 
uh, alone and by themselves. They're constantly in conversation with each other. And it gets even more complicated when you look at behavior. So we see a zebrafish moving, but there's just uh, a whole uh, c like cacophony and, and symphony of these cells uh, kind of working together while that's happening. And we've all been taught that things like neurons are very important in the brain, but that's also not the complete picture. Uh, because the cells around those neurons, uh, we used to think of, uh, of them as like glue that just kind of hold it together, but it turns out that all these cells are actually very intimately involved in how the brain works. So the brain becomes more and more complicated to, to think about. Uh, and the way that we kind of thought about um, mental, mental issues ha has evolved as a result of that. Uh, so this is an example of one big effort done by the NIH uh, looking at uh, other biomarkers, meaning other, other measures of, uh, of how the brain works, rather than using these diagnoses from the, the DSM. So you can see here, if you take groups of people uh, who are categorized based off of typical DSM diagnoses for schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder, or bipolar disorder, um, you can kind of put them into, um, into other categories based off of things like uh, EEG measures and neuropsychological testing to look at kind of the ability for the, uh, for the brain to control thoughts or how it reacts to the world around it. And you get very different categorizations of people into, into different groups. And that also applies across the age span uh, where um, things like ADHD and the autism spectrum, uh, 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 Tick and Tourette's uh, and, and acceptance compulsive issues, a lot of these are actually issues related to connectivity in the brain. Uh, you see a lot of these things actually kind of uh, cluster together. So for example, uh, people who are on the autism spectrum are much more likely to have synesthesia compared to the general population. It's believed that there's connectivity things going on there as well. And so there's, there's a lot of biology going on there that relates to the, the brain's connectivity. And so this new neurobiology has really opened the door for a lot of new treatments, uh, from drug treatments to, to actual uh, to, to talk therapies, uh, to uh, uh, technologies and devices that are non-invasive to actually be able to, to shape the brain. But back in the medical world, if you think, at, uh, think about kind of the perspective on um, kind of how brain health and mental health, what you see is that uh, as healthcare providers are also people who have these stereotypes and stigma around mental health issues. Uh, and it's very, been very clear through a lot of work that's been done that this is harmful and it's a worldwide problem. And it's also a problem for the healthcare providers themselves who are providing that care, uh, who don't present or are less likely to present because they're afraid of stigma to the point where they present in a, in a big crisis um, from, uh, from this stigma that they, they perceive in others and the stigma that they direct towards themselves. Um, and if you look at kind of what we can do about this kind of stigma, there's been many studies done, and, and uh, uh, if you look at kind of like a meta-analysis or a combination of all these studies, one of the interventions that continues to come up as being actually effective, at least in the short term, because we don't have long-term studies, but in the short term, is just social contact. So social contact is one of the ways to actually begin to kind of, uh, uh, to improve upon kind of this issue of stigma, and that's kind of get, being in contact with people who have these mental health uh, differences or, or issues. Uh, similarly, first-person narratives. Uh, so this means having uh, yourself actually talk about your own experience, or uh, whether it be in yourself or a family member. Uh, there's even a program called Coming Out Proud, where it's like a three-week intervention that helps to teach people how to talk about kind of their own uh, uh, kind of their own differences and their own mental health issues or things in their family. And then from the perspective of one neurologist, that's me, uh, I, I think all of this new uh, science that we have around the brain is really important because it helps us to understand how we compare to everybody else. And I think, as, as, I've, as I've said, it's like very complicated because we've got factors related to biology, the structure and functioning of the brain, to issues of the genetics and the inner landscape of the, the brain and the environment that all kind of come together. Um, which makes me wonder, like, what is, what is each other's kind of spectrum? Like, what is your spectrum? When I say spectrum is that all these traits, these behavioral traits that we talk about, do kind of exist on its extremes of, uh, like, let's say, like, uh, anxiety or the ability to control your thoughts or how you react in the environment. You have some people who are less common who don't react very much to the kind of the average, kind of like at the top of the bell curve, to people who have, like, very high expression of that trait. But if you break all these traits down, we all sit at different places along those and at different times in our lives and our different contexts. 
Um, and so each person can be very, very different despite there being a lot of overlap. And you see this beautifully in a lot of work looking at differences in the, in the brain itself. So there's this one study called the human brain mosaic. And what I love about this study is that they took uh, brains and did lots of little measures of brain volume across the whole, uh, the whole brain. And uh, they uh, tried to kind of ask, answer this question, uh, is, there a dif is there a difference between the brain of people who identify as female and people who identify as male? And what they saw is that, yeah, you cannot classify brains into two categories because uh, every brain has so many differences within itself that you just have actually a lot of different brains. You also see this in uh, uh, some work that actually looks at uh, many other brain strands and brain functions and um, that compares behavior and the measures of the brain and how the networks tie together and the genetics that are involved and the chemicals that are involved. And you find there's, there's so much overlap, but there's differences that really relate to, to behavior. And to me, that kind of reminds me of of Darwin and the Galapagos finches, in that the finches look very, very different depending on their environment and what they had going on around them. And the brain kind of evolves similarly. So you can imagine your brain is kind of like its own Galapagos finch, in that it's kind of evolved through your families and your experiences to, be to best handle the environments around you. Uh, you can even see that across uh, environments and, and lifespans, uh, so you have uh, the, enough complexity kind of like the, the spots on the coat of a calico cat from person to person. Um, uh, and I, I, I couldn't help but add this, this one cat there. Uh, there was not enough cats. Uh, um, <laughs> and these changes also progress over time. So as we age, our brain is constantly changing with our experiences and also the biological changes in our brain. Uh, so for me as a neurologist, having this neurobiological perspective just makes me feel a lot more open to other people's experiences uh, and to uh, really approach with a greater sense of inclusivity. Uh, and this kind of brings me back to this point about seeing it as an opportunity to triage between curiosity, compassion, and community, where in any moment with any person, you have an opportunity to to listen, to acknowledge and recognize their experience, to ask questions like, what does that mean to you? How is that like? Uh, wh why do you think that is? To, to compassion, debugging a person's distress, to being open to accommodating um, kind of their, their needs, um, speaking with intention or communicating with intention, using language that makes sense to the people that you're communicating to, and that you're clear about what you're trying to communicate, and also mastering being able to say yes and no. So saying yes to other people's experience, but also being able to say no to honor your own experience and your own needs. Um, and community, being, uh, being uh, able to connect and share and, and clarify your wants and needs with others, to diversify your social networks. I, 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 a lot of the work that I do is around social relationships and brain health, and being able to, to kind of bring in a sense of radical inclusivity can have a, a really positive impact on a person's life, as I mentioned with social contact. Um, and then practicing and, and growing, knowing that it's, we don't start something perfect, right? We, we are going to say the wrong thing. We are going to make mistakes. Um, but we're all in this together, and we're all learning and growing from that experience. And I think it, it, that reminds me of uh, this performance artwork done by this Brazilian artist, uh, Ligia Papa, called Divisor, or, or, or Divider, that uh, despite us kind of appearing very, very separate, there's a lot that kind of connects uh, everybody. And as uh, Krista Tippett reminds us, uh, the question of what it means to be human is inextricable, of what it means to be, um, uh, what, it, what we mean to each other. And I think that's, a, that's a, to me, that's also, uh, it resonates very deeply having mirror touch anesthesia where this boundary between myself and other people at a, a neurological level is very blurred. Uh, and my hope is that at some point we'll connect with each other with the same kind of innocence and openness as two identical twins getting to, to see each other for the, for the first time. So as I mentioned, just having this opportunity to triage between these things, it can be hard to think about what to do in, in new situations, new people, uh, but I think uh, just having this triaging between curiosity, compassion, and community, it makes everything else so much easier. And, and if you want, want to learn more about anything, uh, there's, there's my book, you can find me online, very open to communicating on, on Twitter, or Instagram, or whatever, all the socials. Uh, uh, and I'll be around all day at the conference, so please come up and say hi. I'd love to meet you all. Thank you so much.